Mary, mother of Jesus, but called the mother of God? Mary is one of the most recognizable figures in all of human history. We find her in the art in many cultures on earth. Some call her the first Christian. Others call her the New Testament tabernacle. God calls her blessed above all women. It seems like some venerate her, others worship her, and others want nothing to do with her. Is she a model or example for us? How should her life and walk with Jesus affect how we view Jesus? Why does she matter? How can her story help us better understand Christmas? And beyond Christmas, encounter Jesus for the first time or meet him in a brand new way? How does her story help us become more fully devoted followers like she was? Hey, Sanctus Church, good morning. Welcome to the Christmas season formally. We're already celebrating Advent. We're thinking about the coming of Jesus the first time he shows up and of course, reflecting on when he's gonna return again. And as we were thinking about the Christmas season this year, we decided to do something I don't think we've fully done ever in our church's history. The focus that we're gonna have is on one person. We're gonna focus on Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now Mary, that is the mother of Jesus, is one of the most famous people in all of human history. We find her in literature and art and there are statues of her all around the world. Now, if you take time to actually read what the Bible says about her, it's pretty incredible. But before we get going, we need to acknowledge we're coming from so many different backgrounds. So let's just put the cards on the table. Some of you are spiritual or secular or you're from another formal faith. You might know a little bit about Mary or nothing really at all. Others of you grew up in church environments and you grew up in Orthodox or Roman Catholic environments or Coptic environments. And Mary was at the center of art and prayer and faith. You might have prayed the rosary regularly. For some of you from those backgrounds, now you're part of our church, you might almost miss her, like you miss your mom. Others of you are like, oh, I don't miss that at all. I'm so glad I'm now part of a more Protestant evangelical church because when I was in those other churches, it seemed like we were worshiping Mary and we weren't worshiping God properly and she got in the way of Jesus and I want nothing to do with all of that. Now, some of you grew up in churches where actually you heard nothing about Mary other than, you know, she's Jesus' mom. Others of you might have grown up in other churches. Mary was talked about, but she was downplayed just so you didn't get everything wrong. So it seems some people worship Mary and other people venerate her. That means to honor her highly. Other people want nothing to do with her. And some of us are just confused why we're even having this conversation. So here's the question. As we're diving into Advent, no matter where you're coming from, is Mary a model for us? Is Mary an example for us? How should her life and walk with Jesus affect how I view Jesus? Why does Mary even matter? And how can her story help us better understand Christmas and beyond Christmas? How could her story help me encounter Jesus for the first time or meet him in a brand new way? How does her story and her walk make me a more fully devoted follower of Jesus? Because it sure seems that she was a shining example of being a fully devoted follower of her son. So let's dive in and let's all journey together like this. All of holy history, that's heaven's view of history, has been waiting for the moment when Jesus was born. And in the middle of that great unfolding moment, we find not only Jesus at the center, we find Mary. Years after the Christmas event was long over, uh, Paul wrote this in Galatians 4.4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, really important, just keep that verse up for a second. Not born through a woman alone, born of. Not just through, of. You're like, John, why does that matter? Oh, it really, really matters because we're going to soon discover Jesus isn't just fully human. He's fully God. And Mary has, part, has a part to play in this. So just hold that over here for a second as we keep going. 
We meet Mary for the first time in an unlikely place. Most of us would think God's greatest moves would be at the Jewish temple, of course. That's where his presence is guaranteed, or to a priest, or maybe to someone educated or wealthy, or maybe at a key other center point, you know, Rome or Athens or Antioch or Alexandria, you know, places with libraries and power and money. Nope. The Holy Spirit moves uh, on the fringe of culture. He comes to an obscure, nothing little town. Uh, that's a Roman view. Who cares about that? So God's not just found in centers of power, but in the normal and the nothing and the boring. God always shows up in unexpected places. So our story, which many of you know very well and some of you don't, starts like this in Luke 126. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. God chooses again Gabriel, who is the archangel, the grand messenger of all the angels, and he's always a precursor to divine action. His name, by the way, Gabriel means strength of God, and what strength is about to be exerted is pretty profound in a world owned by death and shrouded in darkness. So his next assignment is to meet a young teenager, a young girl, with the status of virgin. Now, in Jewish culture, when you said a young girl was a virgin, it had two meanings. The first was she was of marrying age. And back then, they got married very young, 12, 13, 14, 15, like uh, early teens. Also, it meant what we would say today, a virgin is someone who's not had sex, has not not had sexual contact. Mary uh, is both of these things. So she's of marrying age, and she doesn't have sexual experience. This, by the way, is predicted 740 years earlier. I mean, this is one of the things that actually had to happen to prove this was real. Isaiah 7, 14. There the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin, the virgin, will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which of course means God with us. So do you see it? Uh, She's a young virgin, but then we read in Luke, she's pledged to a guy named Joseph. So, okay, she's a young teenager preparing to be married, to do what her mother, her grandmother, her great-grandmother always has done, just doing life, family, food, and then, of course, marriage. Now, this is how Matthew records the same sort of event. Matthew 1.18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So, at this moment, there would be a lot of joy and excitement in the air. There would be expectancy. For Joseph, everything's right in the world. It's all good. He's pledged that he's engaged to marry. He's working hard to get everything ready for this coming moment. Most weddings are exciting and full of anticipation, new hope, and we also know that weddings are full of stress and family drama. Anyone who's been married can just say amen really loudly wherever you are. But Jewish weddings almost up the ante and the excitement. So to understand what had already happened between Mary and Joseph, I just want to look back for a moment and I want to read one historian to give us the real understanding. He writes this, Weddings in those days different are different from weddings we experience today in the West. Marriages in the ancient Near East were arranged by parents. A contract was prepared. Vows were spoken in a synagogue. Tokens, like we would say rings, are exchanged. And then the couple would actually return back to their respective homes. Although at this point they are legally considered married, they live apart for the betrothal period, that's the engagement period, which lasted uh, no less than two months, but could last up to a year. So at the end of the waiting period, the groom would take to the streets with friends and family, usually at night, in a torch-lit procession from his home to the bride's home in a grand parade accompanied by pomp and color and singing. And after speeches of goodwill and blessing pronounced over the couple, the groom would take his bride home, where family and friends would eat for a whole week. And the groom's family, not the bride's family, the groom's family was expected to provide enough food and drink for everyone for all seven days. This was a grand event in their life, of course, but here's what's different. The couple was considered king and queen. Some actually wore crowns and dressed in uh, kingly robes, and their word was law. For many people, especially the poor, this is the only time in their life where they would experience lots of food 
and actually get to control a scenario. So <clears throat> everything I've just read has already happened between Mary and Joseph, except the last moment. So the vows are given, yep. Gifts are already exchanged, yep. Families have already met, yep. Contracts have already been signed, yep. There's a good chance that Joseph is taking time to finish building an addition on his dad's house, and that's going to become their new house. A lot of times grooms would leave, and the two-month to year period was them actually building physically the house they're going to live in. So all of this is in motion. And in the middle of all of this, Mary encounters an angel and then God himself. Here's how I imagine it. It's a night like every other night. The clothes are washed. The food is eaten. The fire is probably coals. There, she's going to bed, drifting from dreaming about whatever. And then she goes into REM sleep. And suddenly, she's shocked awake and a man is standing in her room. Now, you just think about that, how terrifying that would be. Fear and terror, all the scenarios running through her head, exposed, weak, defenseless. And he's an angel. He's an archangel. He would have come with such power. I guarantee you the room would have been like heavy. His presence probably brought terror. And yet in the terror and fear, there might have been a peace at the same time she'd never experienced. She felt, I'm sure, paralyzed. But interestingly, as we're going to see, she draws up the courage, not only just to look, but to speak. And as she looks, there he is, powerful, tall, bright, human-looking, yet not human at the same time. I guarantee your breath is taken away, and for a moment, their eyes would have met, and then in that moment, the angel speaks. Quiet, simple statements, but an otherworldly power. I wonder if his voice sounded like a thousand waterfalls. And it says this in Luke 128. Gabriel says to Mary, greetings. You who are highly favored, the Lord, God, is with you. Now, greeting in Latin is the word Ave. And if you've ever sung or heard the famous song Ave Maria, it comes from this, greetings Mary, Ave Maria. Now, the angel says to this young teenage girl, you're, you're okay. <clears throat> no fear, no terror, no sorrow. Why? Because you are highly favored. Mary... God not only knows you exist somewhere out there, He not only sees you from afar. Mary, you are special, you are privileged, you are chosen, you are distinguished. I guarantee she was like, what are you talking about? How is this? Why is she so favored? Because of her looks, her power, her education, her family, her background, her money? Are you joking? No. In the Roman perspective, she's just another nothing. A Jewish tween, a peasant woman who lives, will have kids and die, and no one will remember them. But this is not what heaven sees. The Lord is with you. You have been chosen by God. He's going to give you everything you need. Well, verse 29, understatement of the ever. <laughs> Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Yep. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Do not fear. Why? Because you're favored. What she says, I don't understand. Favor, favored by God? It cannot be. Why me? Why me? I, I, I am nothing. I've done nothing to earn this. Okay, pause everyone. This, this is where the scandal of Christianity already shows up. This is always the question. What do I bring to the table to get God's attention? And the answer is nothing. We bring nothing to the table. It's always God who shows up first. God brings mercy and God brings love and kindness and power. It's always God showing and coming and giving us undeserved favor. We're made favored because He chooses to love us first. Not because we're religious or wealthy or educated or good looking. No, no. Just because He's love. Well, the angel keeps speaking, verse 31. You're going to be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. So you need to name your, your boy Jesus. Now, the Hebrew name for Jesus is Joshua, which means the Lord is my salvation. Of course, that's what he's going to do. He is Savior. But he's not just going to save people. He is the Son of the Most High God. He's the Son of God. That is, he is Lord. He is Messiah. The baby that is coming not only will have the answers to every longing and every broken part and every sin. He doesn't just have the information. He is the answer. 
He's going to deal with every demon. He will even deal with the greatest enemy itself, death. His life will be one that actually embodies favor, and he'll give this favor freely away. This is who he is. I love from the Gospel of John, who writes again from heaven's perspective here, you want to know basically who's going to enter in and reside in Mary's womb? Well, here it is, John 1.1. In the beginning at creation was the Word, and the Word was with God. It reads literally beside God. And then, shockingly, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The one who is beside God and who is equal to God because He is God, He's the one who's showing up here. Well, the angel keeps going. Verse 32, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Someone say amen to that. All the other kingdoms are going to fail, thank God. His, no. Now to us, hearing this, it might have very little impact. It might almost fall in deaf ears. Oh, boring historical moment. No, no. To a Jewish reader, this is everything. This would like just jump off the page. So long before this moment, King David had an interaction with the prophet Nathan. And the prophet Nathan, under the power of the Holy Spirit, prophesied, gave this prediction to David. You can read about it in 2 Samuel 7, 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Your house, David, and your kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. Now, of course, David died, but see his <laughs> distant relative, this child, ah, he's going to do this. The one coming, talked about so long ago, is now going to come and fulfill everything. Now, I'm sure as the angel is talking, Mary's probably completely overwhelmed, completely trying to process him being in the room, what he is, what he's saying. I guarantee his words, like his presence, just sort of hung in the air like smoke, consuming, in, 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 uh, just so strongly in the room that she says, basically, how will this be? I'm a virgin. I, I'm, I am not married. I don't know. I'm 14, 15, 16 years old. This is impossible. Uh, I haven't had sex. I, I don't think I can. I'm, I'm confused. I, I'm engaged. I'm scared. Her virginity is, by the way, repeated three times in this passage. Interestingly, if you go just before this moment, this same angel visited Zechariah the priest, and Gabriel said to Zechariah that his wife was going to have a baby in her old age. That's John the Baptist. And, and basically, Zechariah says to the angel, that's impossible. But then he went further. He didn't just say this is impossible. He said, you need to prove this is going to happen to me. But Mary doesn't demand proof in the same way. She says, I'm confused. Just help me understand. Uh, this is the difference, by the way, between unbelief and doubt. Struggle versus skepticism. Uh, Zachariah says in the chapter 4, how will I know? Mary says, how will this be? It, it's not if, but just how. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, Mary. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, Mary, growing up in a Jewish Orthodox community in a synagogue, would know the word overshadow probably immediately. This is used again and again and again in the Old Testament. As one wrote, this delicate language rules at some crude pagan form of God mating with this young girl. This is not a sexual thing at all. All the way back in Genesis 1-2, we have the first reference to the Holy Spirit, and we begin to understand. Here's how the verse reads. The earth was formless, empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering, overshadowing the surface of the water. Do you see it? It was the very famous Catholic uh, New Testament thinker, Raymond, scholar, uh, Raymond Brown, who wrote this. The earth was void and without form when the Spirit appeared. Just so Mary's womb was void, until the Spirit of God filled it with a child who is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit overshadowed the nothingness, and life was given. But more, but more, just as the Holy Spirit overshadowed the waters that brought forth creation, 
Now a new move, a new creation, for the Creator has taken skin on and bone on and is now present. If you keep reading the Old Testament, there's so many other connections. The Holy Spirit overshadows Moses' tabernacle, the tent where God shows up. The Holy, Holy Spirit overshadows Solomon's temple. And now God will overshadow and reside within Mary. This teenage girl on the fringe of her culture, a nothing in the known world, would become the first prototype. Have you thought about this? Of us, every single Christian. When we become Christians, Jesus comes and resides in us <coughs> by the Holy Spirit, and we become favored, and we become born again. He lives in us. But not just at creation alone, and not just the tabernacle and the temple. Do you know or remember what's at the heart of the tabernacle and the temple? There's a room called the Holy of Holies, and in that room was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. We've talked about this before. The Ark of the Covenant was this chest or box made from Acadia wood. It was overlaid with gold. It had two large angels on the top of it. And the Ark of the Covenant had two functions. Between the two angels, there was this thing, this space called the atonement cover or the mercy seat. This space served as the invisible sort of throne of God on earth. This is also once a year when the high priest would walk in after sacrifice, he'd take blood and sprinkle it seven times to cover sin. Blood covers sin. Now underneath the mercy seat, inside the chest, you had the Ten Commandments and a piece of manna. And you're like, John, why are you talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the temple and the tabernacle? Just hold on. Just place it over here like I said before. It's all going to make sense by the end. Okay, back to the story for a moment. So Mary is told she's going to be found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, what we call the virgin conception or the virgin birth. And by the way, this is a non-negotiable part of the Christian faith. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, then actually you don't believe the essential belief of the Christian faith. All the great creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, say, we believe Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. This is the heart of the Christmas story. This is the beginning of our movement. God comes for us. He is without sin. He is fully human like us. He doesn't, he doesn't appear human. He's not adopted. Some spirit doesn't take over the body of Jesus. Jesus is fully human and fully God. And the virgin birth allows Jesus to be human, but without sin. I love when one person said this, Christians believe we're saved only through Jesus Christ. What does that imply? It is obvious that Jesus is a man, a human being like all of us. But if he's just a man like the rest of us, he shares in our need for salvation, redemption. In other words, he can't save us. He can't redeem us. He's part of the problem. He's not the solution to the problem. So there must be some essential difference between Jesus and other human beings if Jesus is indeed our Redeemer. After all, Christianity has always insisted Jesus is the solution to the problem rather than part of the problem. On the other hand, if Jesus is God and God alone, He has no point of contact with us. He can't relate to those who need salvation and redemption. And His humanity provides the contact, the point of contact. So we arrive at the conclusion, Jesus must be divine and human if He is to redeem us. And the virgin birth allows this. And all of this, of course, is done by the Holy Spirit Himself. Well, the angel keeps speaking and talks now about Zachariah and Elizabeth. He says in verse 36, Even Elizabeth, your relative, she's going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is already in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. And then it happens. Right here. Powerful, humble, like life-changing, earthquake-like experience that ripples down the centuries. This young teenage girl says, I am the Lord's servant. May it, may it be to me as you have said. And the angel leaves. She says, I am willing I accept. God, you can have your way. I know my place. She actually uses the word, I'm your slave, in a pure way, not an evil way. I'm willing to risk it all, including my life and reputation, because I know who you are. And I can say this with freedom because you're not sinful. God, you're not wicked. There's no shadow in you. You're good. May it be to me as you have said. She gives verbal consent. Sometimes we even know what God wants us to do but we don't want to say it out loud. Somehow we sort of believe that if we don't say it out loud, God 
either did not ask for it or it won't really happen. But look at her courage. She actually trusts in a way that most of us probably don't trust God. Well, Gabriel left. The light went back to darkness. The olive uh, oil lamps, I'm sure, are still burning. No one else wakes up. She finds herself with her thoughts and now with a child inside. Well, it says in verse 39, At that time Mary got up and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. And when she entered Zachariah's house and, and greeted Elizabeth, and when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby and Elizabeth leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So right when, this is amazing, right when Jesus enters the room in Mary, the Holy Spirit, who's already in the womb of Elizabeth, makes John the Baptist jump and point. And Elizabeth, verse 41, filled with the Holy Spirit, says these words, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is your child you will bear. This very old woman, under the power of the Holy Spirit, yells out, cries out, under the same power, You, Mary, are going to have a greater role than me, even though I'm older. And your son is going to have a greater role than my son. Mary, you're at the center, and, and your child is at the center of everything. And then she says these words, Blessed, uh, called, more unique, you are more blessed than any woman that has or will ever live in all of history. It was a very famous hymn writer um, and bishop around 400 AD who said this, thinking about Mary. Rejoice, lady. Rejoice, most pure virgin. Rejoice, God-containing vessel. Rejoice, candlestick of light. The restoration of Adam and the deliverance of Eve. Rejoice, holy mountain, shining sanctuary. Rejoice, bridal chamber of immortality. See, this is it. You're like, John and Ella lost. Let me draw all the connections now. Mary's like the second Eve. Eve said no to God. Mary says yes. Mary is like the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God and angels and humans meet. The Ark had the written word of God, that is the Ten Commandments, and manna, bread from heaven, inside. Now Mary has the living word of God inside of her and the bread of heaven in her womb. She's like the tabernacle and the temple because the Holy Spirit shows up and overshadows Mary. And there's more. Like I said, Jesus is fully human and fully God. And if you read the amazing church gatherings called councils, they say something again and again. They say that, especially in the Council of Ephesus and Chalcedon, they say, Mary is the mother of Jesus. And you could say the God-bearer or the mother of God. In the sense, just listen, that Jesus got his real humanity from Mary, but not his divinity. She's blessed above every woman that has ever lived because she really is her, his mom. Now, we should honor her, revere her, see her as an incredible example, but never worship her. One person also in 480 wrote this, Let Mary be held in high honor, but let the Father, the Son, and the Spirit be adored. Let no one adore Mary. Even Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, She is rightly called not only the mother of the man, but also the mother of God. It is certain that Mary is the mother of the real and true God. Okay, <clears throat> what do we do with this? Well, for you who are from another faith or secular or you have Christian memory, but you are not a follower of Jesus, this is for you. Listen to the phrases we've heard. You are favored. Nothing is impossible with God. I'm your servant. Do what you want. I have seen the Lord. See, this is how you meet God through Jesus. This is how the Holy Spirit moves in your life. It never starts with you. It starts with Him. God's favor cannot be earned or conned or slept with or bought. God comes when we're doing everything wrong. And God comes when we're doing nothing at all. And God comes when we're doing good things. And God comes when we're naughty or, or nice. Because God loves us, He wants us to encounter Him. And He wants to make us highly favored. And how do we see and understand and embrace Jesus? Well, by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and why did Jesus come? To give us advice? Uh, to follow or set a, set a new group of rules? No, no. He came to save us. That's why He's Savior. He doesn't come to give armchair advice or, or teach you how to live a more philosophical or moral life. He came to save you from the estrangement from God, sin, death, and the devil, just as the Holy Spirit brought Jesus to Mary. Now, at this moment, while I'm speaking to you, 
The Holy Spirit is literally bringing the good news and the truth of Jesus to you right now. What will you do? Here's what the Gospels, sort of the implication of the Gospels. Paul writes it like this in Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, just like Gabriel declared he was, you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's with your heart you believe and you are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. As the Old Testament says, anyone who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jews and non-Jews. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What you basically need to do is you need to say to God, actually, have your way with me. Save me. I, I, I need salvation. Maybe you've never formally invited Jesus, accepted Jesus, uh, believed who he was, and repented of sin. And so maybe you just need to say right now, Holy Spirit, help me to pray this. And if you've never crossed the line of faith, I can invite you right now to say yes to him in this Christmas moment. And this is what you pray. You say, dear God, I'm a sinner and I do need forgiveness. And I do believe that Jesus Christ chose to be born for me. And I do believe that he lived and died. And I am willing to turn from my sin. And, and I want Jesus to come live, into my, live in my heart and my life. I want him to be Savior and Lord. I want your favor. I want to be your servant. So you just say, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me. Do what you want. I need to encounter you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, for many of us, we've prayed that prayer. You may have prayed it at an Alpha weekend or you prayed it when you were three or you don't ever remember praying the prayer, but you genuinely are a follower of Jesus. For we who are already followers of Jesus, as we begin to wrestle theologically and pragmatically with the life of Mary, why does this matter? Well, I just want to remind you that what was stated over Mary in the end is stated over all of us. If you're a Christian today, that word favored, is true about you. God has said it over you, God has sung it over you, and it's imprinted on your heart. So much of the time, we know God's truth, but we can't get it to our heart, into our DNA. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes into play. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and the truth of God and places them in us and affirms them to the core of who we are. God says to any and all that embrace Jesus, you are fully favored. You are loved, you are forgiven, you are held. Have you ever looked up the word favored in the dictionary? It's quite amazing. Preferential treatment, VIP, no expense spared, special, and privileged. Because you have become a follower of Jesus, you are now a favored child of God in a world that may not even consider you favored, but you are. Remember the words this Christmas that Paul wrote in Romans 8. For those that are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And sonship, by the way, is a legal thing 2,000 years ago in Roman culture. You have rights. You've been adopted. You have access. And by the Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus. If indeed we share in his suffering in order, we may share in his glory. As you are walking through the Christmas season, no matter what is stated over you, no matter what you've done, no matter how difficult things are, remember, you are a favored child of God. And if you can't feel that or access that or understand that, then you need to say, Holy Spirit, you need to bring the truth of my childness and my favored position into my DNA so I can live out of that. Not just out there, that's that idea. No, it's real to me. Make it real to me like it was real with Mary. And lastly, just a small little challenge. Mary becomes our ongoing example of how we live our Christian life. Mary says, confronted by Gabriel and confronted with the idea of having a child without having sex and all the implications, which we'll talk about next week. She basically says, I'm your servant. 
Lord, I, I, I'm your servant. I trust you. I don't just love you. I trust you. I think one of the most important lessons we learn out of Mary's life is this attitude of, I own nothing. Everything I have is yours. And because that's true, I'm willing to trust you with everything. And so maybe as we end, we who are Christians need to, following the example of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the one who bore God into the world, to say these words. And maybe you can join me and pray this way. If you're a Christian, just say, Lord, thank you for making me favored. I brought nothing to the table. I deserve nothing. For many of us, we need to say, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, let this idea of being favored, a child, adopted, deeply root itself in a way that it is not rooted before. So there's freedom and hope and a strength to keep going. But maybe the more significant prayer is following in the footsteps of Mary. We who are Christians in this Christmas season reaffirm and say willingly, Father, Son, and Spirit, God, we're your servant. You do what you want in our lives. You do what you want with our life and health and reputation. And if we have kids, our kids, our friendships, our jobs, we are your servants. You own everything. We'll follow you where you ask us. Help us to have the courage, not just to love you, but trust you like your mom did, Jesus. Deeply root us in this place where we'd be willing to say yes, no matter the cost. Do this Christmas miracle, we ask in Jesus' name. Uh, amen.